Clem Beasold has spent the vast majority of his professional life in the field of forecasting, strategic planning, and futures research. Dr. Beasold completed his PhD in political science at the University of Florida. In 1977, he founded the Institute for Alternative Futures, and today he serves as the chairman and the senior futurist at the Institute. In 1982, he developed a for-profit subsidiary of the IAF entitled the Alternative Future Associates to assist the for-profit world with strategic planning and the application of futures, futures methods. As a futurist, he has worked with many Fortune 500 companies, as well as organizations including the World Health Organization, the National Institutes of Health, the Rockefeller Foundation, and the American Association of Retired Persons. Clem is well published in articles, reports, and texts on the future of government, the courts, and healthcare. He's a consulting editor of the Journal of Future Studies, editorial board member of Technology Forecasting and Social Change, Foresight and World Future Review. In addition, he has served as the assistant director of the Center for Government Responsibility at the University of Florida Law School and as a visiting scholar at the Brookings Institution. Dr. Beasold has authored a number of publications addressing the complementary and alternative care segment of healthcare with particular emphasis relating to the chiropractic profession. His forecast for the chiropractic profession offered seven years ago and 15 years ago. I would suggest to you if we had followed them, we would be in a different place and I think perhaps a better place if we had listened to his advice back then. Here to offer his perspective on the scenarios, potential scenarios ahead for us from the Institute for Alternative Futures, its founder and chairman, Dr. Clem Beasold. Clem? Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Jerry. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, as you've heard, we've done a couple of major reports funded by Nick Mick um, on the future of the chiropractic profession, and it has been fascinating for me. We've worked with many of the health professions uh, and done similar kinds of work, um, but not had the opportunity to sort of relook in as much detail. Thank you. Um, at chiropractic, and um, you know, and it's, uh, I'll, I'll say in a couple minutes some of the recommendations we made 15 years ago, and and seven years ago after we did scenarios. And uh, the good news is that some of the stuff I've just heard in yesterday and today is happening within the, within the field. I'd also like to say it's great to be here at LIFE. It's the first time we've been a beautiful place. Um, and, that the, uh, and to be with the other speakers. Um, John Weeks, you've just heard, when I got into the complementary and alternative field doing our first report in the mid-90s, it was John's writing that was among the clearest of any that I could find in terms of helping me understand uh, uh, coming into the field um, what, what that was about. Um, and what you've just heard in terms of the organizing of the complementary alternative fields uh, is significant. Uh, we had the, our institute had the, the honor of uh, facilitating some of the funding for IHPC for a while, and, and uh, there is significant stuff in what John has just described that is really important for chiropractors as the biggest and oldest and most established of those, those uh, fields. But so some of the things that, that I want to um, cover is, in effect, um, what I've come to conclude is that chiropractic is amazing. Uh, it is an American invention, like football, baseball, and basketball. Um, it is, and, it, and I, the first time I did the, the chiropractic report, I, I created the Bees Old Rule, and that is, if a healing system exists for more than 100 years without regulatory propping up, it must have some value, even if we don't understand it or we can't describe it. And chiropractic turned 100 the, the year that we were putting out that first report in 1985. Uh, I mean, chiropractic is healthy in terms of what it's doing, and yet it's also challenged. And since we did that first report, there's been a number of different assumptions. There's been a decline in enrollments. Uh, there's been um, ongoing challenges of various kinds. There have been um, issues within the profession itself, the ongoing um, splits. But on the other hand, you know, chiropractic remains 
out there and doing uh, pretty amazing work. And vitalism, and this is a tribute to life and to, to you guys on, on that side of the spectrum. Our last report, we did a survey of the deans of all the colleges of chiropractic on a liberal to conservative spectrum. And I had not paid as much attention to vitalism on the conservative side of the spectrum in our first two reports. And in the last several years, vitalism clearly is getting a lot more attention in a variety of different ways from different fields. And, that, and, and I applaud that in terms of the, the consistency. And, and looking at your prior meetings in this Octagon series, there, there were significant conversations about where that, where that is. The, um, um, in terms of the reports that we did, and they're all online, and the, the one, um, this is the, the one that we put out, uh, the second of them, but all of, both reports are online. I encourage you to look at them. This one contains the survey of all the schools. And uh, I've been in conversations with Lou Sportelli, who, who uh, got me to do the first two rounds of Futuring. We may do a third round. And in that, we will relook at a number of, of these issues and then develop additional forecasts going forward. But what, what I'm here today to do is to say, what's primary care look like? Um, not, not, with, not starting from a chiropractic focus, but what does primary care look like? Um, in that they were scenarios that we did. But I also want to say that, that one of the things we came away with is whether the uh, PPACA is upheld or not. And what a fascinating conversation that John walked us through in terms of the Supreme Court. And, you know, the Robert's switching was one I hadn't, wasn't aware of uh, in terms of writing, uh, holding the, the lead in determining who's going to write the opinion will be the Chief Justice, whichever way it goes. But the issue of independent of what, whether parts or all of the law go down um, in June, things will continue to happen with health care. Everyone has acknowledged that it's unsustainable, but there are a variety of things what Clayton Christensen has called disruptive innovations that are out there, that, that are emerging, uh, and that, that we have built into some of the scenarios I'll, I'll go through in a minute. Um, and also the, the um, patient-centered medical home is at the core of the, the PPACA, and I want to give a plug to the report from your group on the medical home. This one, that's, there's I think maybe some more copies at the table. Now, this is a significant statement on how chiropractors can take part and what the strategies are for taking part in the patient-centered medical home. And, and I'll refine some of the details of the patient-centered medical home in a minute, but also say where it's going. As a futurist, that's a stop on the road to a next step which is actually a broader conception of what a, a health home would be. Um, and the um, and quality is evolving, and it's clear that, that there is uh, the triple aim that you've heard about is, and we've been futurists for a number of fields, including quality. And this movement in health quality to the triple aim is one of the bigger steps. It fits with a number of bigger trends to what I call humanity evolving and maturing in terms of what we say is important, what we say is good, and that's quality is essentially our statement of what is good or goodness, and then, then we figure out how to measure it. But the other thing that's happening, and you just heard you know, John Weeks saying that perhaps the task of integrated health providers is to get patients to the point of being able to do their health and wellness themselves so well that they don't need providers. Um, the interesting question is, what are the other technologies that may be emerging that are going to do that? And we, one of the candidates that you'll hear about in a moment uh, is the digital health coach. And to what extent will we get really good health coaches? And I'll describe that, but it reminded me of a conversation that I had with Lou Sportelli uh, early on when we were doing the first round of Futuring. Because as futurists, part of our job is to say, what's coming down the road that will be different? And, and what will threaten anybody's job? Take anybody's job, we can say, you know, is it going to be automated out of existence, or is it going to be challenged? Well, so I keep asking him, so what's going to be the robotic adjuster? And he always chuckled. And, and then that was before massage chairs were available. Then the massage chairs came out. But I'm still looking for that robot that does it. And, and as a futurist, you know, it's, it's, it could be out there. But it's not yet in our report. So the good news is that it's not, it's not clear enough. But let's go into what, what is in, in our reports. And, and in effect, there's great uncertainty around many of these factors, and one of the reasons you do scenarios is to say how to deal with that. These scenarios came about through funding from the Kresge Foundation, 
and we partnered with the National Association of Community Health Centers, had a national workshop that, as John mentioned, uh, Bill Meeker took part in from, we consciously made sure that all of the, the primary providers, licensed members of John's group were uh, rep asked to be part of this meeting. Uh, and, uh, and we interviewed you guys, and in fact, in this scenario, um, I tried to say how many chiropractors are practicing primary care. If you had to guess, how many chiropractors are practicing primary care? Any, any, any guesstimates? Uh, how many? 5%? 5%? 50,000? Okay, it, 5% was what I got, which would be, which would be 2,500. Um, currently, and so, and and um, and I'll tell you the, um, the the chiropractor who gave me that estimate uh, was not happy with the scenarios I'm about to give you, and mostly from a sense of fairness and unfairness, where the healthcare system's going. But but 2,500 doing primary care, the um, so so what are scenarios? And as a futurist, I'll back up and say, you know, scenarios are basically tools to understand what might happen, especially in uncertainty. Um, and they bound that uncertainty and say, oh, let's take it this way or this way and figure out why. But you do that to understand change, to clarify your assumptions, to clarify your visions and say, what is it you're trying to create? And, um, you know, and so we think at the Institute for Alternative Futures that scenarios should do certain things. They should tell you what's likely and what's preferable. They should help you understand both of those things, aid in understanding and in creating the future. Um, they should lead to enhanced focus on vision, visionary possibilities, success, and sensitivity to opportunities. They should be, and then that leads us to say, in your set of scenarios, you should have an expectable or most likely, a challenging, asking what could go wrong, and one and two visionary, or surprisingly successful. Visionary is part of the challenge of saying, if you write it from the perspective of primary care, what's surprisingly successful, not from the perspective of osteopaths or allopaths or chiropractors, but from the, the field as a whole. And so that's, that's where the, our visionary ended up here. Uh, in terms of, of developing the scenarios, we identified key forces, developed forecasts. We did interviews with 56 thought leaders. Um, uh, we did 10 focus groups. Uh, and uh, then we developed these challenging, uh, expectable and visionary images of primary care. But getting to it, we also said, well, what is primary care? And there's standard definitions from um, uh, IOM and from Barbara Starfield, but essentially it's you're in charge, you're consistent, you have the interest of the patient in mind. And, and that, that uh, we've moved to the, in the patient-centered medical home is the, an upgrade, significant upgrade in the quality and def definition of primary care. And these attributes are there. And part of the interesting question is um, for chiropractors, you know, do you want to be the leader in the patient-centered medical home assuring that your team and organization is providing all these functions, or are you a member of the team and doing the specialty neuromuscular piece? And, that's, and, and I think that, that this, um, this takes the latter and recommends that and defines that, I think, pretty well, the, the chiropractic progress report. But, but we think this is really significant. It is a step forward in terms of what um, primary care is. But we started this project with the assumption that many of the things listed here are below the pay grade of a physician and that it will become harder and harder for primary care not to be a real team, to have a variety of people who are able to perform these functions in cost-effective ways and, and to do it that way. And you'll see sort of where that ends up. But there are other emerging models, and one is the comprehensive health home. You've heard about the triple aim here, um, but increasingly we're recognizing that there's a, both a population health target for healthcare, and we're recognizing that there's more than what you do in the clinic or the adjusting table that is affecting health, and there's more of that that has to be dealt with in terms of, of health care. And so one, one thing that has emerged is the comprehensive health home that argues there are several steps beyond um, the patient center medical home that I'll describe a little more in a minute. But, but so the other forces, if you say, so what's shaping health care? And we as futurists ask, what is that? In the macro environment, they're clearly major ones, are, are we into recovery or are we gonna have another recession or two uh, in, between now and 2025? The federal debt and deficits, how controlling will they be? Will we be able to get out of them 
in any kind of manageable way. The internet, social media, virtual reality, all of those are changing the way we live, the way we buy things, the way we market things, and they will affect the way we do um, healthcare. Um, but transparency and empowered consumers also mean that we're getting to know anything you want to buy, who's the best provider, what's their quality rating, what do your friends think about it, those things are all out there. But then aging will put increased demands on healthcare um, significantly. Um, in healthcare itself, you've heard many of these things already, the unsustainable costs in healthcare, the health reform, uh, the pressure for cuts in Medicare and Medicaid that will be out there and will be consistent going forward. Um, defining healthcare as the triple aim, uh, and then recognizing population health and social determinants of health role. And to say a little more, and, and one of the things that we've seen is that healthcare has become less productive over the last two decades, whereas all other sectors have become more so. One of the challenging things is that much of the job growth in the next two decades going forward is in healthcare, particularly the services part of healthcare. But the, the question is, will we and can we make healthcare more productive per person? Can we lower the cost per person? Um, and there turns out there are a variety of factors that are shaping that. The, the other issue, though, is, is learning the role of healthcare over your life course is responsible for 10 to 25 percent of the variance. So 10 to 25 percent of the variance is related to healthcare. If you're sick, if you've got AIDS, the likelihood of your dying prematurely goes up way much higher. Without healthcare, you're in big trouble. But over your life course, it's 10 to 25 percent. The other factors are increasingly significant, and part of the issue is what's the role of healthcare in addressing the behavior, social conditions, uh, the environment, uh, and, and we're learning that. Chiropractors, many would argue that as health coaches, you focus on that, and you focus on that with your patients. And, and in my experience, in, in our two rounds of futuring, some do it much more consistently than others, but, but that's, a, that's out there. But, but, um, and, and we're learning that, in effect, the determinants and factors that we need to focus on affect uh, individual risk factors, and those affect intermediate outcomes and affects the states of health. The challenge in terms of health outcomes is that we have to be aware of all that chain and start counting in ways that play. John, John's uh, week's uh, advice from his mother I thought was very interesting, which is get inside and then raise your criticisms and comments. And in some respects, the outcome conversation is get inside the outcome conversation and say, what are the outcomes? How do we define that? And, and I applaud, you, you heard from Laura, that the Foundation for Chiropractic Progress is doing that, and that's needed. Um, so, so, um, so the community-centered health home that I mentioned a minute ago basically says that, that the health providers will work with community partners to collect data on social and economic and community conditions, then aggregate health and safety data from your own records as the health provider and others to say what are the needs in a community, identify priorities and strategies with community partners and coordinate activities. This is to do health in the community. Um, and act as community health advocates, mobilize patient populations, and strengthen partnerships. So the, there's an active role of being health advocates of health providers. Most solo practitioners, whether they be chiropractors or um, MDs, are not able to or choose not to do this. Some do. Your chiropractor, who is the mayor of his town, I'm sure was into this for a long time. Um, but, the, but that's where the patient-centered medical home is, or where the patient-centered medical home is transforming to the community-centered health home. The other question in looking, and this is significant in thinking about where you guys are. In doing the scenarios, we found that we were getting these very rich images of the primary care team. And you saw language that John and the other speakers showed you that basically you guys get included as well as a lot of other people in what should be on the primary care team or the patients at a medical home. Part of the question of whether that happens is related to financing and what's getting paid for. And, the, and frankly, in integrated systems, you get more choice of who, who you're including in the team. You get more ability to say, uh, we can mix the team versus fee-for-service where everyone who, get, who, everyone who does anything has to be mentioned as getting paid. And so the forecast, the basic forecast we got from one of the people, leading people in the field was that in 2025, we will have only moved a little bit towards integrated systems. That's in the top. Um, fully integrated systems, which is what um, the earlier speaker said that um, 
health reform is aimed at doing, is moving from payment reform towards that top box. Um, a conservative estimate is we only double from about 20% currently to 40% the integrated uh, part of the market. Um, and then 30% use semi-integrated, which is some various kinds of P, um, pay for performance in addition to fee for service. And then the, the, the last 30% remain as uh, fee for service. And that's both concierge care for the affluent, community health centers, uh, and low income folks. Um, the, so given that lead in, we ended up with four different scenarios. Um, many needs and many models, which is sort of a continuation of both the confusion and the challenges that we have now. But the second scenario gets even worse. And there, there are mad, a number of things the system as a whole could face. But then the third is primary care that works for all. And if we move more seriously into integrated systems into payment, and we looked at the other things emerging, what will that be? And then the fourth says, hey, wait, given what's coming down the road and given the cost of health care, I am my own medical home and I can do that. And so those are the four scenarios. I'll give you a little more detail of them. But the first is uh, many needs, many models. We get an expansion of the patient-centered medical home. That defines the core of what primary care is. Uh, you get some shortages of PCPs, uh, primary care providers, uh, and all members of the primary uh, of the patient-centered medical home team practice at the top of their license. So that's significant in the way that that's done. Uh, you, get do, you do get a focus on prevention. Um, you get the forecast I mentioned before of 40% moving into integrated um, payment forms. Electronic me medical records do come. I should say as a futurist in the issue of full disclosure, as a futurist for about four decades, I've been saying that electronic medical records are coming in the next decade. Well, I'm still saying it. Electronic records are going to be here in the next decade, but this decade, I'm right. They're going to be here. But they will. And, and they will be significant in terms of what they do, how we look at things, how we can compare things, um, how your practice as a, uh, a chiropractor can be compared to other chiropractors and other providers for the conditions you're working on. Um, on the left, it says personalized vital signs. One of the things we'll have is that most phones will be smartphones within five years. Increasingly, there are a whole slew of apps to measure your heart rate, your blood pressure, your sleep quality, your, you know, a number of things um, that will be built into your record, that will have those just as ongoing factors. Those, and, and you know, the, I was once told that um, metal fatigue in engines can be forecast. You can put a sound device on them and you can tell by the sound, you know, when they're gonna be fatigued, when they're gonna fail. Well, people have said, you can do the same thing for a heart. And, and, and you as trained clinicians may already know which, what those, those sounds are, but you can put these device monitoring on people and get closer to personalized uh, assessments of your own conditions. And over time, build up your definitions of normal. So we're gonna have personalized vital signs that will be part of, of clinical care. But those are gonna be used by doctors, nurses, chiropractors, and Dr. Watson. You know that Watson beat Jeopardy humans, Watson beat the humans in jeopardy. And right away, and this was in 2011, right away they announced that in 2013 their next application was gonna be Doc Watson, organize all, organizing all available knowledge and putting it right in front of the physician. Well, WellPoint decided that wasn't fast enough, and this year, in 2012, they will be coming out with pilots using Doc Watson. As a futurist, we argue, oh yeah, that's coming, but so are many other things that will be like that, and then essentially clinicians will have all available knowledge and appropriate knowledge put in front of them, and then that will be also made available to consumers. So we will have Doc Watson uh, available either first to the experts and then to consumers. But we'll also have uh, digital health advances in agents, gaming, social networks. So patients like me will become more and more common in terms of uh, where do you go if you have a condition, who else has got it, did, that, did, did Dr. X or Dr. Y um, do you any good? Do you like their bedside manner? Or do you like their, their um, consumer attitude? All those will be available, the exchanges. And what was interesting with, the, with uh, Matt, Matthew, that um, our reading of an expectable future is that employers will, as the exchanges come out, um, uh, prefer to drop patients. He pointed out that that uh, implied it may be good for them, but he did say that it would be bad for many workers. But we think the pressure will be there for um, employers to make sure the, the exchanges work and then move their move health benefits off the table for themselves. 
Um, but in this first scenario, you also get significant um, disparities in access and quality of healthcare that remain. So you get wide variation in this, this first scenario. The second scenario, lost decade, lost health, said, says that we will have recurrent severe recessions. That's, that's out there, and that will be coming. Uh, and that you get a shortage. You know, this is a headache for providers. And you um, chiropractors who've been out there a while who were able to develop successful practices that now may be challenged or that were recession affected, this will become, this, that part of the future, the past, will be part of the future. And that many providers drop out if they have the option. And so that you get shortages in a variety of settings. And you get even less movement to fully integrated care in this second scenario. But you do get advances. I mean, we get, we get a cure for Alzheimer's. You just need 60,000 um, to deal with it. And so essentially in scenario two, the, the, the best advances are available to the wealthy. Um, and you get many more uninsured in this scenario. And many turn to the black market. The Doc Watsons, the digital health coaches in scenario two are free, as they are in each of the scenarios. But in this, they are free or they're given by your providers. In scenario two, the ones that are free, Microsoft and others will give them to you. And it will be advertiser driven. In scenario two, the event that got digital coaches into trouble was that one of the advertisers was an herbal remedy. The herbal remedy had not really been checked out fully. Turns out it had a very nasty side effect with a widely used prescription medicine. 3,000 people died in scenario two because of using this free digital health coach. And so the, the warning is that there's a lot of black market activity and there's a lot of uh, free activity that, that play out in, into that scenario two. But now if you say, so what would be successful? surprisingly successful. And so one is on the upper left, the triple aim is pursued and accomplished. And that is uh, lowering per capita costs. So we have um, 15 years of lower per capita cost for healthcare. We have um, great experience of care, all the IOM six aims rolled into one. Uh, and we get pop increased population health. And the core of that is the community centered health home in primary care is a key driver of accomplishing the triple aim. Um, you get expanded teams of providers, chiropractors and colleagues, uh, and the, the provider on the right is a community health worker in the person's home. In this scenario, organized integrated systems take full advantage of the digital, digital health coaches, the personalized biomonitoring, the advances in how we can provide care. And they make them available to the person on the team who gets closest to the patient by going to their home and that's a community health worker. So the community health worker carries the system into the home and um, interacts with the patient. If they need additional care, if they need to see, see someone, the community health worker can schedule from the person's home immediately uh, in terms of what they need. In this scenario, we assume that 85% of the market moves to integrated systems. So these are, this is, this is capitated care. This is sort of doing it right with a great um, pressure for cost effectiveness and lower costs in this uh, third scenario. Um, you also get uh, this scenario addresses local social and economic foundations for equitable health. There's a high commitment to health equity in scenario three. Uh, and it's recognized that, um, you know, that creating healthy communities is a significant part of what's needed for, um, for, for achieving health. The other thing about capitation is if it's smart, we'll pay for it, uh, particularly if it reduces costs. And you heard examples that I think it was Jerry giving, that if you can take seven back surgeries and turn that to three or four, you're saving 600,000, if I heard him right, for a practice. And so the, the issue here is that in capitation, the kinds of things that you heard Laura say uh, chiropractors doing in terms of describing their outcomes and their value is appreciated and, and uh, brought into, into practice. But we're also looking at um, increasingly being able to map our communities and understand where are the hotspots for ill conditions and what are we doing about them? And, and how do we proactively then go out and look at those? The fourth scenario says, all that is good, but uh, if I'm making 26,000 a year and, and a good competitive, lower cost, cost reducing managed care plan is 6,000, I can't spend over 25% of my income for healthcare. And besides, I've got all these tools, so I could do it myself. So this scenario, about 40% of the market goes into managed care, but about 40% uh, 
goes into consumer-directed healthcare and takes care of it themselves. And they have a variety of tools that allow them to do that. The non-invasive biomonitoring I mentioned, um, the wellness and disease management applications, which are very common and personalized to you, um, the personal health record that is there and is friendly for you, and your own digital health coach or avatar. Um, and that, that a, in, this, in all the scenarios, big name vendors um, offer free avatar-based coaching um, with other products. The quality varies in terms of this, but also many healthcare providers and consumer-directed health plans make sure that you've got, you've got a, a, a very effective digital coach. Uh, and that you also get facilitated disease networks so that, that the patients like me become even more significant in this scenario because you're asking your friends. It's like Angie's List for healthcare and for conditions and what to do. Um, much of the population, as I mentioned, MOPS, opts for self-care and high deductible insurance. Uh, consumers buy health-related products uh, and services through competitive markets. So again, you can, you can find out if you have to buy something and you're on your consumer-directed plan, you know who's got the best price for the best quality from people like you with conditions like you. Um, and the demand for human primary care providers in this scenario declines. Um, and that healthcare costs are significantly reduced. So this, is, this combines that comment that John made um, into that scenario. So in, in when we do scenarios, we often will have uh, something that compares in more detail. I've just given you the highlights of the story. That's, uh, and that's all in this report, which is on, online at our website um, at allfutures.org. So let me back up and say, any questions about these scenarios? So far, I'll, I'll ask for questions again in a minute, but any, before I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk for a moment about our scenarios for chiropractic and what we said 15 and seven years ago in doing those scenarios. Uh, all, our website is altfutures.org, www.altfutures, like alternative futures, altfutures.org. And if you Google primary care 2025, um, it will probably take you right to the report. Um, so, so the question is, um, we did the two reports for chiropractic. Uh, and, um, and again, it was just, a, you, know, you know, chiropractic, like baseball, football, and basketball, is an American invention. You know, it was right here. Uh, and, you know, and, and just in the, the videos, uh, as we came in from lunch, you guys are all over the world. I like, um, you, you know, I've, I've worked with uh, your guy in Geneva, the Canadian, Damon Chapman Smith. I mean, I, I think that, you know, I, I've got a lot of respect for the professionalism with which chiropractic has evolved and is run. Um, and so it's been interesting for me to do these two, these, these two reports. The, and and the, the full website where they are is, is there, but you can Google either of those titles and they'll get you there. So, so the question is, you know, what did we say? And given what I've just described, I pulled those up. So in 95, we said more and better healthcare uh, was the first scenario, uh, sort of not unlike what we did. The hard times in frugal healthcare was, was there. Um, the, the self-care rules, what's our number four now, be, uh, you know, was number three when we presented it um, back then. And then the transformation is more like what we call scenario three. When we came back a few years later, we looked at those and we said, well, we'll, we'll just, you know, um, they're, they're pretty much similar, but three and four emphasize certain things. One is evidence-based collaboration. And that is everybody gets into saying, you know, how do we practice with people who make a difference? How do we monitor that? How do we, how do we um, figure that out? Uh, and then the fourth is, and it was interesting, um, D. Eddington yesterday recommended that chiropractors consider becoming, he, he used the term, close to healthy life doctors. I thought, that's really interesting. And many of you do that. Um, it is not as well developed and a um, product line among most, uh, and it's not the core of um, chiropractic business, but, but uh, becoming healthy life doc doctors is a, was one of the things we identified in 2002. What was interesting for us is we gave a variety of recommendations that, that still hold in the sense that um, first uh, asp um, aspire in the sense clarify chiropractic's identity and vision. We said that a couple times we appreciated that you actually tried to do that in the unity effort uh, in I think around 2003 or something. Um, and, and it's still needed from my distant perspective um, that a shared vision, especially that better unifies the profession, is, is uh, significant and remains out there. But um, the determined chiropractor's role in primary care, we said 15 years ago, and it's still out there. And, the, and, and again, this, um, this PCMH study, I think, is very good. I think the big question is, um, 
in terms of primary care, um, do you want to take on the risk and the other tasks that are part of the patient-centered medical home and increasingly the community-centered health home? Um, but the, uh, and engage managed care. And, and again, I applaud the work of the, the Foundation for Chiropractic Progress for arguing that you're positioning the outcome studies that will do that, because I think that's, that's where, where you have to play. Uh, enable chiropractor to practice more broadly, and again, that sort of moves up the patient-centered medical home, you know, what, what uh, well, it deals with some of your current issues. But then um, mo monitor, define, collect, and share outcomes. We argued in 1995 that every chiropractor's office should be an outcome generator, a research lab that says, you know, what, what good are you doing, uh, for who, uh, what kind of difference does it make, what are the preconditions or other things. And that, that if you assume we have electronic medical records, that's pretty easy. You know, now, 20 years later or so, we're, we're coming into that. But that's, so that's still, still relevant. Um, and promote health equity was one of, and, and actually don't produce surplus chiropractors. I don't know if that's been the case or not, but clearly in uh, 1995, this was our biggest mistake in the first scenarios was we forecast a doubling of chiropractors from 55,000 to about 100 and some thousand, 103 or something. That didn't happen. That was right at the beginning of the, of the downturn in applications. So that was, that, was our, that was our biggest mistake. Again, as transparency is a futurist, that was not right. But the question is, um, you know, and some deans that I've talked to have said, oh, well, actually what we've done is stabilize that our pre, we had a pretty astronomic rise, we're sort of stabilizing at, at what was our stable number. Um, but the, the issue underlined in the bottom of promoting health equity is I would say that as a futurist, we look at increasing awareness of um, what's fair and what's fair in healthcare and in that, that um, in a variety of different areas, people are saying it is unfair that low income people not only don't have access, equal access to care or that if you're, if you're African American, you get your cancer identified later and you get treated later and you have outcomes that are, that are different. Those are avoidable differences which we are increasingly saying are unfair. And unfair is a moving target. And we've watched the World Health Organization redefine care. WHO said we can't claim to have achieved health for all unless we meet certain values, equity, solidarity, sustainability, ethic, gender, and human rights, a big mouthful. But that's essentially humanity changing. And we've watched in the United States the Healthy People 2010 objectives for the nation go from saying we should reduce health disparities to we should eliminate health disparities. And the 2020 um, uh, objectives, I'm sorry, 20, you know, 2020 objectives um, have reinforced that. We are calling for saying that we should have fair outcomes in health uh, and that, that that's a moving target. But I'd argue that, that chiropractors should be at the forefront of that as well. Most solo doc practitioners, that's not a, that's not a core consciousness, especially if you've got a cash practice. The, uh, and then in terms of recommendations for, from 2005, um, accelerate research, that, that's good that that's being done. And, and I was impressed when I started in 95 at what Nick Mick and others had done in terms of funding. You guys had to pay for your own research to get you as far as you had come by 95 in terms of the inroad in the federal government. Uh, and you're still in that situation where you have to, you have to make that research happen. Uh, but develop greater uh, integration with mainstream healthcare, and I agree that the you know, the more both in training, in interprofessional education, uh, in practice, uh, that you can do the better the, the field will be. I anticipate and en engage consumer directed care, and so I, I think that you may want to consider: is there a chiropractic run um, consumer directed health plan? That yeah, and, and part of the question that has come up in some of the other presentations is um, how much risk do chiropractors want to assume in terms of taking over managing? That's a big question. But, but, but I'd say uh, engaging consumer-directed healthcare and figuring out what the, uh, what the argument is uh, for that. And then, again, uh, chiropractors' contrib contribution to public health is significant. Uh, and your, the future of prevention and wellness, you're there. The question is whether you've got the tools for it. And the next speaker is going to, is a leader from your field as chiropractor doing organized prevention and wellness, the question is in terms of, the, of what's on the ground and the apps that are coming down the road and the way that we'll use social networks for that should be part of a practice. 
The final one, developed geriatric chiropractic, uh, is just given the demographics and where the demand is going to be. Increasingly, that will be that, that will be there. And so, so those are you know. So that's the what Jerry said. You know, if we uh, having if you had done more of this in '95 or in 2002, you would be better off now. It's still those are still important things to do. Um, the implications in closing for this uh, is to uh, pursue primary care and and consider. Um, certification is PCMH, and that was that was raised before. I think I think you should. I think you should have some chiropractors who do it and define what chiropractically focused um, PCM medical home medical homes would be. I think it's important for, for you to, to, to have that. Uh, but then also develop community centered health homes and say go further and say what is it that it means to do the kind of assessment of community conditions of partnering of being a health uh, community health advocate. Again, this is not what a solo practitioner can do. It requires teams. Uh, and so that's a, that's a, a practice issue, and, um, a management issue. Um, define chiropractic outcomes and values. And, and I, you know, as, you, as you've heard, it's great that you're doing that, uh, and that needs to be done more effectively. Um, the other is prepare for periodic and possibly significant cuts in healthcare payments. In that we will, we will do that, you know, the, the Medicare payment issue that keeps getting postponed, at some point will happen. In scenario two, we said that we would have two cuts of 10% over the next 10 years, just you know, sort of random cuts. That's in addition to, to moving things off. You know, what, and so, so that can happen, and that's in terms of rates, and uh, payment rates. The issue that John and others have been saying is you want to make sure that you're on the list of essential benefits, that you're included, amen, you, you need to do that. But even if you are, um, be ready for um, service-specific cuts in payments that will be out there. Um, and then as, then, as I mentioned before, the, one of the things is holding the risk. To what extent do you want to be, create the systems uh, that do that? I mean, there's a very valid argument that the treatment costs, and this was what I think Laura was showing, that you have lower outcomes on a number of major conditions for people in chiropractic treatment. The question is, you know, uh, is, uh, you know is that enough for you to step up and, uh, in effect, take over the spectrum of care through tertiary care and the risk? And I think, I, you know, I think that that's, that would be, um, if there are experiments like that, please let me know. <laughs> uh, but, if, but if not, it's relevant to consider them. So, so with that, I'll say thanks and take questions. Yeah, either, either way. I never saw that. Uh 1995 report, but the, that uh, surplus chiropractors, that, that term kind of got me, as maybe some other people here. Uh, and they projected maybe 110,000 chiropractors would right. probably be an undesirable number of them or something like that. Or do you have in mind an optimal number of chiropractic practitioners? No, and it's interesting. If you look at our, our um, 95 report, we actually tried to, to say there's a, there's a matrix in the back where we, we tried to work primarily qualitative futurists, but we sometimes deal with numbers. And it depends on, you know, what share of back and neck issues you get. Um, and there's, all, there's dis distribution issues that we, I wouldn't even get into, but just overall, uh, what share of back and neck issues do you get pain? To what extent does our PTs and other comp competitors out there? Um, and, and so you can, you can take a look at the numbers. I don't have a sense of what would be optimal. At the time, it looked like given, what, it looked like that the path that chiropractic was on was, was potentially creating surplus. I don't know whether demand has dropped. You know, clearly supply of chiropractors has not risen. But I don't know to what extent demand has dropped or so whether there's surplus chiropractors in the field now. So what they had in mind uh, when uh, they came up with this uh, concept was chiropractors are only treating neck and back pain then, apparently. Well, we, we children and uh, families and and when when we looked and, and it was interesting because I was trying to say you know sort of what and, and I I really enjoyed being part of this family event the reception last night this is clearly a family gathering and I talked to a couple of, of uh, female chiropractors who do guys may do this too but they were uh, treating pregnant women and doing and it was it's fascinating both treating women and the the uh, infants um, and. Um, 
and I don't, and I, I don't know if that was, I didn't press far enough to see whether that was what you call a wellness visit or just getting, um, you know, the, the, one of them said that in a sense, you know, if you get the, if you deal with the nerv nervous system of the, of the pregnant mom, you're also dealing with the, the effect of the nervous system into the, into the fetus. Um, we didn't, we didn't deal with that in either of those, those first two, you know, those sort of broader categories. We tried to find evidence of what's, what is the practice pattern, what's the buying patterns. And most of the data we have say that, you know, the, what walks in the door is primarily neurologic back, neck pain. There's a lot of other things chiropractors do and they get trained to do. Um, and when we looked at the primary care question, one of the things we got back is that it's 2,500 chiropractors who practice primary care, and somebody said, but they must all be in rural areas. And some, some are not, but the question is, in your state, will, if you code for anything but your normal um, manipulation codes, will you get paid? And because most insurance companies won't pay, that gets limited. So those are, I mean, that, that was the, it, it is clear that chiropractors do a lot more, but it's not clear that people sort of respect or pay them for more if it's on an insured basis. Is that, I don't know if I, if I. Okay, you're kind of getting there. I just, um, you know, the whole, my mindset on this thing is that I graduated from this institution. We talked about changing the world and uh, we talked about uh, way beyond neck and back pain. Uh, you know, asthmatic children and all kinds of different things like this because of the value of uh, chiropractic care. Um, so I was just kind of concerned when I heard that. I've never heard the term surplus chiropractic, I guess. You know, so. <laughs> I, maybe there's maybe there's so, only so many back pain well, cases. And, and, and you, you need to remember that in the mid '90s, the people who were doing forecasts for physicians uh, were arguing that we would have surpluses of physicians, and so we were not the only ones who were off. But they, they were arguing we were going to produce surplus physicians, um, and mm -hmm. and they were clearly seriously wrong, uh, as we were. But but the issue is just and, and the way I turn it around is, do you know either high unemployment or uh, you know, in other, are there, are there, you know, are there chiropractors whose businesses are not very good and not getting enough demand? Is the way I'd phrase it. Another way to describe surplus uh, chiropractors, and I don't know. I haven't looked at that closely enough. But, but, but it is. But on the other, so, yeah, I'll stop there. Okay. Thank you. Great. I have yeah. a question. A couple of things. Uh, first of all, you mentioned how primary care physicians uh, are kind of identified by saying, are you doing something other than manipulation codes? But the only way that you identify whether or not those codes have been uh, actually even submitted is whether or not they're paid. That's where the statistics come from, right? So even if I was a primary, a primary care doctor and I was submitting things for other than the codes that a chiropractor, you would never know that because they're not getting paid, they're not getting approved by the insurance companies, even though I might be doing them. Mm -hmm. So there's just, there's a large gap between what could actually be practicing and what the statistics would say. Yeah, no question about that. that okay. In other words, in, um, um, and in cash practices, um, you know, the chiropractor may be doing a number of things, but right. what, goes, what gets the patient is able to submit to the, the insurer are the, the standard categories. So I would just say that that's, I mean, although it's a 5%, I wouldn't necessarily uh, take that at face value. Uh, and one other thing I wanted to, to just comment on, uh, the International Chiropractic Pediatric Association has done some very uh, comprehensive studies within their practice-based research network on things like pediatric care, on uh, you know, maternity care or pregnancy care, uh, and they've gotten some very, some very good statistics, and that's been within the past, say, five years uh, that they've actually put in these kind of large-scale studies. So if you haven't considered or even looked at that, I would highly suggest that, too. Great, thanks. I'll, I will put that on the list for I do have a question, though, out of yes. all of that. <laughs> um, what is your futurist interpretation of what happens to the insurance, the health insurance industry? It depends. And the question, the, you know, the, in effect, the scenario one says, you know, it's around, it still holds a lot of the, the market um, in the, uh, in the scenario three, when we move to, um, I, I think, I think um, y y sort of like what Churchill said about the U.S., Americans will always do the right thing after they've exhausted all the other possibilities. 
And, and this goes to the issue of single payer. And, and NPR, the news hour, of, or PBS news hour, featured these scenarios on their website uh, and did a national poll on their likelihood. And, and the biggest comment we got is, you, didn't, you left out single payer. And this is all getting to what happens to insurance companies. And so I think, I think we could well end up in single payer. And one of the, Barbara Starfield was one of the people I quoted. Unfortunately, she passed away a week after our interview. But she said, we'll get to single payer and we'll do it the way that the Canadians did. The Canadians rejected it. And then province by province, they adopted it, they liked it, and it, they put it in nationally. And she said, we're going to do it state by state. Enough states are going to have experience with it that in X years, two, three, four decades, we'll have single payer. So that's one view of, of where insurance goes. Um, the issue, uh, and, but then the other, the other question is just sort of what happens in the exchange. We didn't, we, we chose not to even put that on the table in the, the Obama reforms. Um, but but uh, that's plausible over the longer term. Uh, in the near term, insurance you know, has been a big part of the problem. Excuse me, it's some of the same issues that health exchanges face, and that is, are they active shapers of the nature of care, which they have not been? Well, I just, I beg to, to differ. I mean, mm -hmm. being in primary practice, I've seen, I would say, hundreds of people that make determinations on what they consider is right for them based upon what's covered by their insurance. For better or worse, I think it's for worse, but uh, although you would say they're not making determinants, they are kind of, but just in a backdoor way. Um, yeah, and, uh, let me rephrase it. Insurance companies have not done much to improve health care. Um, have that, not used That the, I would agree with. The, yeah. <laughs> okay. Good. Well, then, the um, uh, uh, other questions. I got a quick, uh, just a quick one here in terms of some of the studies and the, all the things that you learned uh, when you were going through school here and whatnot. And for example, the National Board of Chiropractic Examiners says 97% of the chiropractors use uh, a nu uh, nu uh, nutritional counseling in their, in their practice somewhere along the line. And I want to commend you for what most people don't do, certainly in the town that I live in, Washington, D.C. You, when you come before a group like this and you say, these are the things I, I, I uh, thought would happen and as a futurist, and you can report back, these are things I didn't get right. That says an awful lot about the reliability and your, the humble people that can do that are people that I want to go back and get the information from. David Broder did that every year. The senior dean of Washington columnists every year in December would go back and critique his prior 12 months and say, boy, I was right there. And boy, did I miss that one. And it's great to hear this because it really gives a perspective, and I thank you for that. Okay. Thank you.